My name is Abdel Razak Takriti, and I am the Mahmoud Darwish Visiting Professor of Palestinian Studies here at Brown University. It's been six months and five days since Shirin Abu Akhle has been murdered by an Israeli bullet as she was covering events in her beloved Janine refugee camp. Shireen was a veteran journalist, a very well-known journalist, I would dare say the best known journalist in the Arab world. She was a household name. Many people grew up seeing her face on the screen. Many generations of young reporters were inspired by her and by her work. The murder of Shireen did not come in a vacuum. It took place because of the very special conditions prevailing in Palestine, colonial conditions. It took place because there are no protections for Palestinians in Palestine. There are two peoples living in historic Palestine. One people has weapons, another doesn't. One people ha has nuclear weapons, another doesn't. One people has actual full control over the physical space, and another is subjugated to that control. Shireen was a victim of this broad matrix of control under which Palestinians have been suffering since the British occupied the space in 1918 to this very day. The Israelis continued, expanded, and entrenched this system of colonial control. They expelled a large number of Palestinians in 1948, and then in 1967. But those that remained had to be dominated, had to be subjugated. Shireen was one of them. She had the courage to report on this domination and subjugation. She spoke about every little detail and every large incident. No story was too big for her to cover. Those stories that required a lot of courage, she would cover them. And no story was too small for her to cover. Everyday life stories, stories of the people, their suffering, their existence, their trials, she would cover them. That is why she was deeply loved. And that is why when she was murdered, there was such an outpour of grief over her murder. Now, she wasn't the only journalist that was murdered. There's many journalists that have been murdered before, but her murder exemplifies the broader dynamics that are unfolding in this space. And today's panel will reflect on these dynamics all the while discussing Shireen's legacy and what it represents. We have a distinguished panel, a truly distinguished panel, and I'm really honored to be here with the speakers. First, we're going to hear a presentation by Jennifer Zakaria. Jennifer is Shireen's cousin. She's been at the heart of the effort of Shireen's family to achieve justice, recognition, accountability for this murder. It's very painful for her, of course, to come and discuss this issue, but she is also ideally placed to do so because she's an attorney and writer. She holds a JD from Columbia Law School, so she understands the legal issues very well. And she has an MIA from Columbia School of International and Public Affairs as well. 
a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley, she has worked as a journalist and with various human and civil rights organizations. I am honored to introduce her today. And please, please give her a warm welcome on behalf of the Brown University community. Thank you, Abed, and the Center for Middle East Studies and Brown University for hosting this event in Shireen's memory. It's an honor to be here today with you all. Last Friday marked six months since we lost Shireen. Half a year after losing a loved one, the conventional wisdom tells you acceptance begins to increase while disbelief, yearning, and anger recede. Grieving, of course, is as individual as the circumstances of death and the particularities of the relationship between the living and the dead. But regardless, it seems that in a healthy grieving process, disbelief, yearning, and anger should ebb and slowly be replaced by acceptance. Ours has been a grieving process of six months in which we are unable to accept the fact that Shireen has been killed. Our attempts to heal have been consistently thwarted by the fact that there has been neither accountability nor reckoning for those who ordered and carried out the killing, and that every day we watch more and more Palestinians lose their loved ones to the same brutal military that assassinated Shireen, a well-known journalist wearing full press gear covering yet another raid on a Palestinian refugee camp. <clears throat> to be with Shireen was to love Shireen. It was easy and comfortable to be around her. She was funny and loved to laugh. She was kind and compassionate. Her outstanding professional capabilities and qualities were matched equally by the kind of sister, aunt, cousin, friend, and mentor she was. For every person I encounter who met her, there is a story of her generosity, her empathy, her encouragement. For everyone who watched her on television, there are retellings of tragic national moments, human catastrophes during which they felt less alone, less lost, because Shireen was in the midst of it, honest, steady, telling the truths so often otherwise obscured. For her family and close friends, there is worse than silence in her absence. She left a void that is unfillable. Today I would like to talk about Shireen as an integral part of the story of Palestinian resistance. Palestinian resistance, which is currently under attack on innumerable fronts, is a multifaceted, varied phenomenon, and as many ways as it displays itself, there are attempts to silence and quell it. Shireen approached her role as a journalist with a deep curiosity and eagerness to understand. She treated with dignity and care the lives of those whose stories she told. She believed every instance of suffering and heartbreak, every tale of injustice and longing deserved to be heard. She shared these stories day after day for over 25 years as a reporter. In so doing, she created a robust collection of reports about Palestinian life across time and geography. She artfully wore, wove a national unified story of Palestine that sustained, sustained and comforted Palestinians everywhere and helped erode the geographical and temporal distance created artificially between us. Her consistent documenting of Palestinian lives celebrated our national existence, even while covering the ongoing attempts to suffocate it. In detailing the daily mecha mechanic mechanisms of occupation, she refused and rejected every aggression by and every intention of the Israeli government with its implicit, implicit message that our lives are not worth as much, our suffering is irrelevant, and our resistance is illegitimate. In addition to contributing a source of shared experience and information for Palestinians and Arabs more broadly in her day-to-day -day coverage, Shireen also documented the actual resistance of Palestinians. During the Second Intifada, she spent a lot of time in Janine. Where you will not see such stories in most of the Western press, Shireen relayed the experiences of resistance to military occupation. Through her reports, we saw the details and nuance usually denied in the telling of the Palestinian experience, the names and backstories of the people confronting the occupation, which grounded her every report 
reminding viewers that this was no ordinary situation, but rather that every Palestinian's freedom of movement and bureaucratic existence is subject to the whims of armed soldiers of a hostile military. Contrary to the tendency of most Western press to condone and replicate the Israeli narrative that elides Palestinians into one disposable, dangerous mass of would-be terrorists, Shireen's reports shed light on those qualities that are the most rare and admirable in humanity, bravery, conviction, unity, and compassion. There is common cause between Ukraine and Palestine given that they are both opposing military occupations. Ukrainians, like Palestinians, have been bravely resisting their occupation. If you have watched Shireen's reports, you recognize this as the reality of the Palestinian struggle. However, in the Western press, acts of Palestinian resistance to the occupation are dismissed with words like violence, clashes, and the resistors themselves are pejoratively called militants or operatives. While we learn about the pain and suffering endured by Ukrainians at length and in great detail in the mainstream press, there is scant comparable coverage about what suffering under brutal military rule has is been like for Palestinians. <clears throat> Just this past week, the New York Times opened its coverage of the battle over the city of Kherson by noting, in Kherson, national songs were banned, speaking Ukrainian could lead to arrest, and students were told they were Russian. Cue the resistance, end quote. Throughout the piece, the paper of record refers to Russians as occupation authorities. The, su the successful removal of those occupying authorities is referred to as the city's liberation. Most reports lament how it will be cold without power this winter, how the latest Russian assault left Ukraine's capital without running water. In October, the same paper ran a piece called What's It Like to be Shelled? with pictures and descriptions of what living life under falling bombs is like. In these numerous articles, we are introduced to Ukrainians who are suffering under the occupation. They voice their frustration with what has occurred. They tell of the horrors they witnessed or feared. They speak boldly about their rights to be free of occupation. One would expect that when such violent, unjust invasions happen, we should hear in detail about the human suffering in as much specificity as possible so that we might bear witness and in some way comfort those enduring hardships and strengthen them with our compassion. Meanwhile, on October 25th, an article from the same paper goes to painstaking measures to detail the experience of the occupied through the eyes of their occupiers. Quote, Israeli forces carried out a major raid against a Palestinian militia. End quote. Rather than chronicling the efforts of the fighters to stop the destructive military, Israeli military incursions into Palestinian civil life, the article's tone remains estranged and unsympathetic, referring to one of the Palestinians as an operative. It is clear from the context that the Israeli action is suffused with the logic of the reasonable and necessary measures a nation state might take in self-defense, not an overwhelmingly powerful army perpetuating its sixth decade of military occupation. When we read on, we are told that many Palestinians have championed the group's fighters as popular heroes, in part because Israel's occupation of the territory has dragged on for more than a half century and become increasingly entrenched. After reading this article, I was struck by the stark difference in tone and description. Why is occupation in the Ukrainian scenario clearly to be condemned and the struggle against the occupiers noble and heroic and to be lauded and supported militarily, financially, and with our compassion, where the Palestinian plight remains hostile and unsympathetic. The rest of the article relies almost exclusively on quotes from Israelis and siphons most Palestinian experiences through the perception of Israeli military officials. The statement that the, quote, Israeli army has kept Nablus under a tight siege for about two weeks, severely restricting movement in and out of the cities, end quote, is not then explored for how it impacts those living there. What rights to move, to work, to eat, to live are denied. We do not learn the names or see the faces of those living under heavy artillery fire or middle of the night raids that lead to arrests and killings. Instead, the next line is, quote, in an effort to contain attacks, Palestinians have decried the closure as a collective punishment. Palestinians have decried it. As, as if collective punishment is not a legal term with a precise definition of which all components are met in the case of the closure of Nablus, Janine, and other West Bank cities recently. We are told that the militia 
that, quote, the militia has won the admiration of many young Palestinians, end quote, but not, it is implied, by us. The article implies, continues in a similar fashion, interpreting what's happening not from the perspective of the people invaded, but with quotes and framing from the Israeli military officials and politicians. In an article about this campaign involving, involving siege that killed a number of Palestinians, we don't learn of one inhabitant's experience, not one personal detail, not one quote from someone living there. When there is a rare article that does explore what the experience might be like for Palestinians to live under siege, the frame still remains the idea, idea of parity between the two parties and employs the tired trope of Israelis responding to Palestinian violence as the point of departure. Instead, it could be understood, and the reports could indicate, as is done in the case of Ukraine, that the inception of violence, of aggression, is the occupation itself. But Shireen, told the stories. In 2002, during the Second Intifada, she spent many weeks covering the Battle of Jenin. Through her time in Jenin, Shireen not only gave voice to those fighting for freedom with care and compassion and respect, watching the resistance in action, she felt inspired and strengthened. In her own words, she said, quote, to me, Jenin is not one ephemeral story in my career or even in my personal life. It is the city that can raise my morale and help me fly. It embodies the Palestinian spirit that sometimes trebles and falls, but beyond all expectations, rises to pursue its flights and dreams. She suffered, end quote, she suffered tremendous heartbreak when many of the young men she met defending the town were killed in the wake of the Israeli military's attack on Janine refugee camp. When six Palestinian prisoners escaped from Jalbuwa prison in 2021, Shireen covered the amazing tale of a flight from the most secure Israeli prison by inmates who tunneled an escape route with an everyday spoon. To this she noted, quote, in Janin, we met people who have never given up hope. They have, nev they have not allowed fear to infiltrate their hearts and have not been broken by the Israeli occupation forces. It is probably not a coincidence that the six prisoners who managed to escape are all from the vicinity of Janine and the camp. And this has been my experience as a journalist, she continued. The moment I'm physically exhausted and mentally drained, I'm faced with a new surprising legend. It might emerge from a small opening or from a tunnel dug underground. Shireen was crushed when the escaped political prisoners were apprehended. It was obvious they were severely mistreated after being caught. Still, it is a statement of strength of the, on the strength of the Palestinian people and the enduring will of resistance to occupation that people in such dire circumstances never stop trying to liberate themselves. In stark contrast to the New York Times article cited above, Shireen usually began her reports with an off-screen introduction to the issue where she provided background. Anybody interviewed usually got a personalized introduction and then were given free reign to tell their story without a filter or lens and without qualifications. Shireen provided no prejudgment or sense of hostility toward the subject. She employed the strategy even with Israeli government personnel and let their words and images speak for themselves. Her technique was universal and she used it in every context. It demonstrated her integrity and respect for journalism as a vehicle to unearth the story of even the most beleaguered of people. In 2010, when she worked out of the Washington DC Bureau of Al Jazeera for several months, she filed a range of stories. She used the opportunity of being here to explore the experience of Palestinian Americans who had lived through the Nakba. She also made a trip to the southwestern US where she filed a series of stories offering sympathetic and affecting coverage of Native Americans and their plight. Shireen's starting point was always that of honest inquiry and eagerness to hear and provide a platform for the words of those whose stories she covered. Her empathy and honesty drove her reporting and her interactions with all the subjects of her coverage. It is a sad reality that Shireen lost her life reporting on yet another Israeli incursion into Janine refugee camp. When her friends and colleagues suggested she not get up early in the morning to go cover what seemed to be a run of the mill confrontation, she insisted on going to demonstrate her solidarity with those voiceless and misunderstood people who continued to struggle 
against the ceaseless attacks of the occupation. The message given to Palestinians has been clear and consistent. The brutality of the occupation will persist as long as we have the audacity to believe in our own history, our own identities, and our entitlement to the same freedoms and rights as others. Shireen's work, her life, and her, now her death all attest to that fact. We have been seeking accountability for Shireen since she died, and as you have likely heard, the FBI and DOJ have opened an investigation into her murder, as it is appropriate for the killing of a US citizen abroad by a foreign government. We have been requesting this for six months and are ready to support the US in conducting an independent, credible, and thorough investigation. We call on all parties with any evidence to cooperate. Israeli officials have responded to news of an FBI probe with anger and statements that they will not cooperate or provide any information about what happened that day. This only reinforces why an independent, effective, and credible investigation by the United States is so necessary. We are also grateful for the support of senators and congresspeople who have called for an investigation. 57 congresspeople and over 20 senators signed an initial letter requesting an independent FBI investigation. Representative of Car Carson of Indiana just introduced the Justice for Shireen Act, which asks for a thorough and timely report on the investigation and asks if weapons, if, if US weapons or aid were used in the killing of Shireen. We must also continue Shireen's work. We must listen to Palestinian stories and expect to see them present and represented in the tellings of their lives. We must challenge the narrative that portrays Palestinians as arbitrarily violent actors. We must acknowledge that the path to Shireen's murder was paved by the impunity for all the crimes against Palestinians that preceded it. We should respond to Palestinian suffering with compassion and solidarity and outrage no longer with silence, dismissiveness, and more aid to the Israeli government and military establishment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for this very powerful statement and I really salute your courage, uh, your steadfastness, uh, your persistence. Uh, and I salute the courage, steadfastness, and persistence of the rest of the family. I know it's been a very difficult time for you. It's been an incredibly painful six months, but your work uh, is deeply important, uh, not just because it's there to honor the legacy of this incredible individual that we lost. And not just because it's gonna help bring accountability for the enormous crime that was committed, but also because it opens up a pathway for reflecting on the general horrific situation that is unfolding in Palestine. In discussing the case of Shireen, we're really talking about everything that is happening in Palestine. That is why so many thousands of Palestinians went out there to mourn her. And Shireen's funeral, which was brutally attacked, by the way, by the Israeli forces to add insult to injury, uh, was the largest since the funeral of Yasser Arafat, to give you a sense of scale. This was a moment of collective grief that had not been witnessed for a long, long time in Palestine. So to reflect on the situation as a whole, we're gonna have now a discussion. And we were really honored uh, to have two uh, major human rights organizations represented in the figures uh, of senior staff members in them. Um, they're gonna help us think through this issue uh, in relation to the broader dynamics at play. And Jennifer, of course, will be part of this discussion as well. Uh, I'm honored to be introducing Omar Shaker, who serves as the Israel and Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch, where he investigates human rights abuses in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza, 
and has authored several major reports, uh, including a 2021 report comprehensively documenting how Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution against millions of Palestinians. As a result of his advocacy, the Israeli government deported Omar in November 2019. Prior to his current role, he was a Bertha Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where he focused on US counterterrorism policies, including legal representation of Guantanamo detainees. As the 2013-2014 Arthur and Barbara Feinberg Fellow at, the Human, Rights, at Human Rights Watch, investigated human rights violations in Egypt, including the Rabah al adawiya massacre, one of the largest killings of protesters in a single day. A former Fulbright scholar in Syria, Omar holds a JD from Stanford Law School where he co-authored the report on the civilian consequences of US drone strikes in Pakistan as part of the International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. He also holds an MA in Arab Studies from Georgetown University School of Foreign Affairs and a BA in International Relations from Stanford. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Secondly, we have with us Shirin Tadras, who is the Deputy Director of Advocacy and Representative of, of the United, to the United Nations for Amnesty International. She leads a team of senior advocates to lobby for the protection and promotion of human rights across the world. Prior to her current role, Tadris was a Middle East correspondent and news anchor for Al Jazeera English. So she was a colleague of Shirin Abu Akhle for a while. And Sky News, where among other events, she reported on the 2008 and 2014 Gaza Wars, the Arab uprising uprisings and the rise of the Islamic State group in Iraq. The accolades for her work in human rights and journalism include a Peabody Award, an Emmy nomination, and several Royal Television Society awards. Tadros is an experienced speaker and moderator. Her engagements include speaking at the UN General Assembly, as well as uh, a peace-building co uh, conference in Rwanda, and moderating the FIFA Conference for Equality and Inclusion in Zurich. She grew up in the United Kingdom, graduating with a degree in politics from SOAS University of London and a master's degree in Middle East politics. So please also join me in welcoming her very warmly. So Omar and Shirin, do you have any thoughts and reflections on this very powerful presentation that we just heard uh, from Jennifer. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm so struck by how, how difficult it must be for the family to, at the same time as mourning, also advocate. Um, but that was really what Shirin was all about as well. She mourned for the people that she was reporting on, and she used that to spur her advocacy for the liberation of Palestinians. I first had um, the wonderful encounter with Shirin in 2009, and I just finished covering the, um, the, the war in Gaza that lasted about 21 days. And I, I, I'd come out of the Gaza Strip, and um, you know, in my small journalist elite world, I was a little bit of a celebrity because I'd got, gone in knowing nothing, and then suddenly everyone thought, well, I mean, she must know everything about the Palestinian conflict. And the problem was I knew very little. I could tell you a lot about Gaza because I was stuck in there um, during the war. And I could tell you how long it took from the Eris crossing point to Rafah or where you could get your eyebrows threaded in various locations. But about the lived experience that is apartheid in the occupied territories, I knew so little about. And what always struck me was how generous Shireen was with her information it was actually very difficult to speak to Shirin, honestly, because she was constantly surrounded by people. She would go and report on a story, 
and you try and sort of get to her so you can ask, what exactly is this about? How, do, how am I meant to report this? How, do you, how are you doing this? And it was really hard because she would be surrounded by four or five people, usually children as well. And they'd be, you know, wanting to ask her questions. They'd be wanting just to just sit with her, wanting her autograph, wanting to take a selfie with her. She was so generous with every single person. Um, and I and I learned this trick when I was a reporter working for Al Jazeera because, of course, my name's Shireen too. Um, but no one really knew me, nor did they, you know, care if I was going to report on the story. So when me or my producer would try and interview someone, we'd call them up and we'd say, you know, we'd be interested in coming and speaking to you about what just happened. Usually they'd say no. So I would tell them, but I'm Shireen from Al Jazeera. And they'd be like, oh, Shireen, of course. Of course, please come to our house and I, you know, we're going to have tea and, and I would know what I was doing, but it was all in the interest of the story. Um, and I'd go and, I'd, and I'd, they'd open the door and they'd go, where's Shireen Abu Akhle? You know, and, and they'd look around me. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. My name's Shireen too. And I work for Al Jazeera and I'll, 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 I'll tell her about <laughs> you guys. So she opened doors for those of us who weren't in that, in, in, in her position of, you know, being so loved by, by the Palestinian people and beyond, beyond, you know, and certainly even in the Arab world, when I would when I would go around and I and I'd be reporting, um, some people would shout out Shirin Abu Akhle, and I'd be like, no, but thank you. Um, and and you know her her you know the way in which she humanized the Palestinian story was unique and it was important, and we miss her. We miss her every day as friends, as colleagues. Um, and as advocates. And I think that the best we can do um, is to do exactly what you have been doing, Jen, and, and despite the pain, to continue her legacy and what she would have wanted us to do, um, which is talk about the issues and what brought her to Janine that day, why she was there, and why it is a crime. Thanks. Uh, there's so much that struck me about uh, Jennifer's presentation, but let me maybe start uh, for an audience that isn't familiar with the Middle East to tell you how major of a figure Shireen was. You can imagine there, there are millions of Palestinian refugees that live in Jordan, that live in Lebanon, that live in Syria. Any time, which is you know almost every day for decades, that Palestine is in the news, people across the region are glued to, and Jazeera is probably the primary outlet. And Shireen was the one who so often was describing the reality of what took place. So for millions of Palestinians, Shireen was their Palestine, their voice to Palestine, their narrator, their guide, the person who held their hand and sort of told them a lived history of Palestine. So um, as Abed mentioned in my introduction, I was based in Israel, Palestine for several years. I was deported. And I've been largely based in Jordan since. So the morning that Shireen was killed, um, I, uh, at the time, I was living with my in-laws. Uh, my, my wife's family are Palestinian uh, Jordanians. And I usually have an office space in their house that I work in. And everybody knows, you know, when I'm working, I'm there, I'm writing, I'm researching, I'm doing interviews uh, to kind of leave me alone. But that day, everybody in the family, up and down, opened the door. What are you guys doing about Shireen's killing? Like, are you investigating? What's happening? Like this, you know, I've never in my, you know, years in this job had a story that, like, at such a deep, visceral level affected so many people that wanted to know what I was doing about it. I, I sat with my, my wife's grandmother uh, watching Jazeera that day, and, and she, you know, there was, I think, someone on who said, what are the human rights groups doing? And the, her grandma pointed at me and said, yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> Just trying to sit down and have a cup of tea with you. But, um, but more than that, I think, you know, what, when um, Jennifer mentioned uh, the story of that, that morning when people asked, I actually didn't know that, that people were like, Shanine, why are you going? Because this is why are you going to Janine that morning at 5.30 in the morning, mind you, right, to report on a raid. Um, that, I mean, again, as a professional who works in this, that part of the story stuck with me. So I've been in this job about six years. And I, you know, again, I'm not there now. But when I think to myself, would I, again, our work's different, right? But would I have gotten up after two decades of doing this work and gone to the front lines to cover a raid at 6 AM, the integrity of, of, of a person who still did that every morning, just that part of it as, again, as a co-professional with Shadeen, um, you know, really stuck with me. And Abed, when you mentioned the funeral, and it was brutally, um, 
cracked down upon. Uh, I think there's a part of the story that, what, that Western audiences don't know about Shireen's funeral, and so I want to relate to that, which is, for many of us here, it was um, the shocking moment. You know, how can the pallbearer of a funeral be beaten back? How can Shireen's body uh, almost fall to the ground? It was, it was just outrage, and of course it was outrageous, but there was also a moment of triumph for Palestinians, right, because, um, you know, East Jerusalem has been occupied for 55 years. Uh, the Israeli government methodically roots out expressions of Palestinian identity, uh, the f raising of the flag, demonstrations. All of these acts are criminalized. But Shireen's death for two hours had this moment where occupied Palestinians felt that they had reclaimed Jerusalem. And the reason Israel knew all the cameras would be there. Israel knew this would be a leading story. It still chose intentionally to uh, disperse that demonstration because giving Palestinians a moment of triumph, a moment of feeling that they had overcome domination, that was too scary to the Israeli uh, you know, colonial project. So I think it is remarkable. I, I firmly believe that one day when um, you know, apartheid is dismantled, Shireen's fingerprints will be on there because it'll be moments like this that people will, will, will look at and say, you know, when we stood up, when we came together, we broke that even for, you know, for one, for one moment. Um, I, I, I wanted to start with the personal side of Shireen because it's easy to just get to the big picture, but, but there's much more there and you can hear it in Jennifer's voice and that stuck with me. But I mean, I'll just say a word now and I know we'll go there in terms of the larger picture. I also um, uh, was very taken by what Jennifer said about her killing was paved, you know, by impunity that the Israeli authorities have enjoyed you know, for years. Again, Shireen's killing uh, has been documented by major, I mean, international organizations, the UN, New York Times, all of them have conclusively showed that Israeli authorities gunned her down. In fact, the most recent investigation that was done by Al-Haq, the Palestinian Human Rights Group, and Forensic Architecture showed that when Shireen was gunned down, they recreated what the sniper saw. And he could see from that vantage point, 180 meters away, that she had press written across you know, her, 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 her vest. And it's worth, again, noting that that person still pulled the trigger. Something like that doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It's the product of months, years, decades of killing Palestinians, of, of daily structural violence and impunity for that. And again, it's worth reflecting. I mean, we're here talking about Shireen, and we should be here mon uh, honoring Shireen, but there are hundreds, uh, you know, thousands over the years of Palestinian journalists, uh, activists, demonstrators, everyday people that have been gunned down, doing their job, going about their professional life, and it's the impunity that builds that. And then I think the last point I'll just make in this opening part is just to say, um, you know, in the way that Shireen dedicated her life to telling the stories of Palestinians living under uh, apartheid, living under uh, their, their, their current repressive reality, her death highlights the larger, you know, context. It highlights, exemplifies the daily structural violence, the repression, the apartheid, the persecution. That's a reality for millions of Palestinians, and I hope her killing can be a moment, and it has been. I mean, what's happening in Congress, what's happened with accountability, is in many ways watershed moment. I hope it can be a watershed moment in, in terms of moving forward, recognition of the reality for what it is, and the types of actions that we need to take, given that characterization. You know, listening to this, uh, there are moments in history where you could feel that something momentous has happened, something that symbolizes broader dynamics. And I think uh, one of those moments for me, and I've been, of course, uh, part of this Palestinian experience from for <laughs> most of my life, all, or most, all of my conscious life. Um, one of those moments was actually the beginning of Sh Shireen's funeral. What happened in Jenin camp uh, was incredible. When somebody gets gunned down normally, and they get shot in this manner. You know, it gets sent for medical examination, the body, and people then will mourn. The people of Jenin decided to do something else with this body. They were like, we're not sending it to the medical examiner before every single person in the camp gets to march in this procession 
in honor of this journalist who was following everything that was happening in the camp, even when it was a small raid at 5.30 a.m. They moved that body to the corners, across the corners of the camp that she knew very well, that she had spent days of siege in, that she had spent time in people's homes in. Every home in that camp was open for Zineen Abu Aqil. And any, if you go to Zineen camp, they'll tell you that almost everybody knew, knew her, not just knew who she was. So when we're looking at it today, the camp is being assaulted today. It's actually one of the key regions that is targeted today by the Israeli state. Shireen's journalistic instinct was not off when she was covering it, because she knew that this is one of the target areas that is, has been subject to regular incursions for years, and that has been subject to intensified incursions in recent years. The people of the camp had all been ethnically cleansed from their homes in 1948. And yet, they were there, continuing their resistance, continuing their struggle for freedom, and continuously being subjected to this horrific grinding machine of oppression. Who is covering that story now? We have some journalists covering it, but not all of them are going to go out at 5.30 AM to cover a small raid. And many of them, and this is my next question to you, to, to you all, many of them might have to think twice now and three <laughs> times, because these acts are meant to discourage people from covering as well. If you can kill Shirin Abu Aqli, the best known journalist in the Arab world, you can really kill anybody. Is this about killing journalism and silencing it? That's a question for you guys. What are the implications? I mean, Shirin, you were a journalist for many years. I think you spent a decade with yeah. Jazeera and yeah. Sky News. No, I mean, I think, I think it's, it, we have a, a war that's being waged on the truth and truth tellers, right? So it, it goes beyond that. I mean, you have to all realize that we live in a world where a journalist can walk into a consulate in Istanbul and get murdered and cut into little pieces, and he's quite well known, and nothing happens. And an American Palestinian journalist can get sh shot, killed, on with with video footage, you know, circulating the internet and be extremely well known, and nothing happens. So if you are thinking that you're going to have careers in the future, be them in in human rights or be them in in diplomacy or be it as journalists, anything that essentially tries to change the world or tell a different story to what governments want you to, to tell, then your life's at risk because there is a huge amount of impunity in this, in this world that we live in. And if we let this one go, then we contribute to that impunity. And I fear for us here behind the table and all of you in front of the table uh, and what, what the future looks like. So I do think this is a very serious moment. I don't think when I was starting in journalism many, many, many years ago, this was, it was half as bad. I think that the line between journalism and, and activism is not clear. And I think at the end, this is you know, a war on truth. Um, and it's, it's one that we, we have lived through here in, in four years of the Trump administration, you know, head on. So everybody in this room should be very much aware of, of what that feels like. Yeah, and I think, I mean, look, it's important to keep this in, 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 in perspective, right? So um, many people forget that in 2018, 2019, you had this sort of incredible moment in Gaza, um, especially in 2018, where you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza marched to the fences separating Gaza and Israel as a show 
of um, sort of uh, um, declaring their right to return to their homes. 70% of Gaza are refugees. Um, and uh, as a way of asserting their right to lift the closure. And what happened during then was that the Israeli government telegraphed. They said it was, you know, they said we are going to use lethal force against demonstrators. They actually articulated a legal theory to justify, which of course doesn't justify it. So it's a perversion of international law using live ammunition against these demonstrators. And you had dozens. I mean, you had on the day in which the U.S. Embassy opened in Jerusalem, you had uh, more than 60 Palestinians gunned down, among them journalism journalists, including Yasser Morteja, uh, you know, a, a young Palestinian man who was gunned down and killed. And again, like Shireen's killing, uh, telegraphed, right? And when I say telegraph, what do I mean? People often forget what happened in the days before Shireen's killing. Um, the, uh, in, in the uh, aftermath of attacks by Palestinians against uh, Israelis in Israel that killed, uh, I believe, 11 Israelis, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett at the time said there would be no restrictions on the Israeli army and its operations um, you know, in, the, in the West Bank. I mean, he said that directly. That was, I mean, less than a month before Shireen was gunned down. And that part of the story completely sort of wasn't covered by people, that this was actually, he directly said there would be no restrictions, right? Um, and Shireen's killing is coming we're, we're in, what, mid-November of 2022. We have, depending on what data set you use, a 16 or 17 year high so far in the number of Palestinians killed in the West Bank this year, right? Um, so again, it's a situation where, I mean, among the mo a mother of six who was shot and killed walking without any weapons, without anything, at a checkpoint. Stories like this taking place on a daily basis. I mean, the Israeli government has sanctioned use of force standards that, uh, you know, permit killing Palestinians in situations not authorized by, by international law. Again, depending on what data set you use. Committee uh, for the Protection of Journalists, 25 Palestinians that have been killed um, in the last two decades. Uh, the Palestinian um, Union of Palestinian Journalists puts the figure at about 46, I believe, uh, in, in a shorter duration of time. So, and, and, and the UN Commission of Inquiry, and I started with the Gaza protests, um, they actually, the UN did a commission of inquiry into those killings, and the commission found that the Israeli authorities gunned down journalists knowing who they were. That's the direct quote from the UN report. And again, this went in a shelf somewhere. The UN said Israel shot journalists knowing who they were. And what surprise do we have that nobody was held accountable for these killings? And of course, what do we have here in 2022 uh, but a journalist gunned down clearly with evidence showing that they know who they were. So, you know, we have a structural systemic problem here, and we need to confront it as such. Do you remember the armed with a camera quote as well? Yeah. I mean, an Israeli official said after, when asked on camera, you know, what, you know, what was Shireen's crime? You know, she wasn't armed. Why did you, why was she killed? He said, well, she was armed with a camera. I mean, that, that's really, that should really send shivers up your spines. And if I can also add that, you, you, and Abed, you asked us the question about what's the message that's being sent. I, I want like the audience to sort of take a step back a little bit and imagine all the different sectors of society and sort of what's taking place right now, right? So at the same time that we have this, this event with Shireen uh, and the killings of Palestinians, we had another escalation in Gaza, you know, 49 Palestinians killed. Without provocation, the Israeli army launched, um, you know, airstrikes. You have today six of Palestine's most prominent uh, you know, human rights organizations that have been criminalized. So the Israeli government has declared, and the, uh, one of them, Al Haq, has been around for more than 40 years. Before I was deported, which was three years ago, I spoke at their 40 year anniversary. They're a model of human rights organizing, not just in Palestine, but the entire global south and the entire world. And the Israeli government woke up one day and decided that they're in a terrorist organization and an unlawful association. And it's not just some order they issued one year ago. They raided their offices in August. They interrogated the heads of two of these organizations. They affixed closure orders to their doors, right? Um, so you see what's happening to human rights organizations. You see what's happening to media organizations. Uh, and you remember, of course, that according to the Israeli government, right, of course, you know, uh, Jennifer talked about resistance, so any form of Palestinian resistance is terrorism. But even when you call for boycotts, you know, that's grounds for denial of entry, that's calls for criminal sanctions within Israel proper. So you can't 
resist violently. You can't call, you know, for boycotts, right? When you do journalism, you're gunned down. When you do human rights work, it's terrorism. Last week, the UN passed a resolution for an advisory opinion at the International Court of Justice on the legal consequences of prolonged occupation. And the Israeli ambassador to the UN took to the stage to say that, what was the exact quote? It was diplomatic, uh, 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 weapon of mass destruction. Uh, I think that was the exact quote for asking the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion. What option are you telling Palestinians is permissible besides submission? Jennifer, there was something that struck me in your uh, talk, which was the reflection on the kind of journalism that Shireen was offering um, and the contrast between that and the sort of journalism about uh, what's happening in Palestine that we see in mainstream Western outlets. Um, I was thinking while you were saying that, that also these mainstream Western journalists tend to hang out with Israeli sources more so than with Palestinians. They don't live with Palestinians. Anybody that knows the journalistic scene in uh, uh, the area knows that these American and British journalists, what circles they roam in, who are their sources. Every time the Israeli government holds a press conference, they're there. When Gaza is being pounded and bombed, they're not going inside Gaza. They're sitting on the hill of shame, <coughs> reporting what the Israelis are telling them. I was in the UK when that happened, in 2014, for example. And it was actually shameful. Do you have any thoughts on this question? How Palestinian journalists are essentially, and Arab News Network journalists in general, are the ones that are really covering what's happening on the ground. What does that tell us also about the journalistic profession today? I mean, I think that's true. I think the Palestinians um, are the ones who um, know what's happening. They're the ones that care about what's happening. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, it's deeply problematic because, uh, as I mentioned, I think that the same level of attention to personal experience and, um, and the depth of suffering, it, 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 we deserve to hear that from people who are living it um, everywhere, not just in some places. Um, I think that um, I think the Washington Post just had an editorial about um, the investigation, the FBI saying that they're going to do an investigation that was excellent. That was where the editorial board of the Washington Post said, what do the Israelis have to hide? What does that mean to tell us that you're not going to cooperate with our investigation? Um, so I think journalists can care about other journalists, and I think that maybe this is an opening for that them to realize, like we've all been saying, this didn't come out of a vacuum. This, this is a, something that came from a whole series of experiences. So I think there's some cause for hope that maybe um, there will be um, some minor, minor change, but I think also we have to hold those reporters accountable. I mean, I think there has to be some sort of uh, complaints uh, louder than they've been about the fact that we only received this very truncated, partial, Israeli-centric narrative. And um, it's irresponsible as, as, as a journalist to, to conduct that kind of reporting, I think. I mean, to just go to the military uh, um, and the spokespeople for the military and get their view on everything and then create a story around that without ever sort of pushing back on it, using their language, their construction of events, their construction of the conflict, um, what to call the people who are engaging in struggle. It's, it's deeply problematic and it's deeply ingrained in, um, I think, most Western press. And, um, uh, and, and then linking it to the, the last question, I think that you asked what, it, what this, the killing of Shireen, ha, what impact it has on other reporters. And I think it has a, a real chilling effect. But I also think that Palestinians, after all, um, in order to exist, have to keep on um, doing what they're doing. So I think that what ends up happening is um, you're at risk in a lot of 
avenues of life as, as a Palestinian, you know, whether you want to protest or whether you want to report, be a reporter or whether you want to conduct human rights um, um, investigations or uh, advocate for people, anything that you do that runs afoul of the Israeli narrative that you should basically accept your submission um, is dangerous, as you just said. And, and yeah, so I think that, you know, in, in, in it's chilling, but I think for Palestinian journalists, there's no other way forward but to, and I still think Shireen inspired a lot of journalists, and um, as many as her death might have chilled out of it, she created a hundred more who are eager to um, fulfill her legacy. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just say, I wouldn't cast aside all Western journalists and Western media, right, or, 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 or non-Arab, because, you know, the truth is there's some excellent journalism done by Western media and some very poor journalism done by Western media. And the same is true for Palestinians and Arab outlets, too. And, and I think your, your key, you know, what you said is key about accountability of journalists. But let me just give, get, give you a sense of what it's like to be a rookie reporter arriving at the Jerusalem Bureau of any network. Um, on my first day, one of the first things that you have to do is go and get a GPO, a government press card. Without a government press card from Israel, um, you cannot operate in the territories at all. You, you have to have a GPO card if you're a journalist to report the story. When you get there, apart from the laborious, ridiculous process it is to, to get one of these GPO cards, you have to sign a bunch of things about what you can say, what you can't say about the military, which in, initially set, you know, scares you because you, you now are quite scared about what you can and can't say and being thrown out of the country. And then you give them your telephone number and your email address, and there goes your privacy. So by the time you get back to the office, there's about 15 emails from different organizations. One of them, for me, was called the Israel Project. And the Israel Project said that they would take me on a tour of Israel to try and get me to understand a bit more about what you know this country is. And I thought, what a great idea. I get to go on a helicopter. Wonderful. So I go on this helicopter ride the next day, and they take me um, above you know, the territory, but they managed to go past, bypass all the settlements so that they didn't talk about them at all. And the whole idea is to show you how slim Israel is. Like it's this tiny little area and we are surrounded by these Palestinians that hate us, the Iranians that hate us, the Syrians that hate us. Like we are just trying to survive here. And they start talking to you in this language of defense. And then you get back to your desk and you get a press release from the military and it says the Israeli Defense Force, not the Israeli army, the Israeli Defense Force has responded to an attack by doing X, Y, Z. And there starts the indoctrination of this idea that Israel is doing what it, what it does because it has to protect its citizens out of necessity. And the entire language is done like that. And then when I came to the UN, I realized how powerful that language is because it's not just about narrative, it's about covering yourself legally as well. It's about necessity suddenly, it's about military necessity. That's what they're doing. It is a highly sophisticated PR machine. So I think a lot of it has got to do with sometimes where journalists um, socialize and some bias, and some of it's to do with lazy journalism of the fact that when you ask for the Palestinian side of things and you call the number that the Palestinians give you to check what happened, the, the number will ring, 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 and then finally you'll get a Yahoo email address that you will never be responded to. And on the Israeli side, you have four different numbers where in about four minutes you can get every detail you want from the Israeli military about the strike that just happened. It is very easy to get this kind of information it is very hard to get it from the Palestinian side. And if you are not a good journalist, and if you're not obsessed with telling the truth and balancing it out, you will make this mistake over and over again. But Shireen, let, let me press you a little bit about this, because I hear this a lot, and I think it's also a trope. It's not that hard to get information about what's happening in Palestine. Yes, calling officials, maybe. But what about what Shireen Abu Akhli used to do? Just go out on the street and talk to people. When there's an event, a raid, go to check out the raid. Go do what journalists do, report. I mean, if something happens here in Providence, the local Providence paper reporter will go to, for example, uh, the place where a fight broke out or a gas leak took place or uh, a good teacher was given an award. Mm. 
why does that not happen is, is the real question. Because this is not just some uh, Palestinian Authority incompetence story. There are dozens of human rights organizations that are very active in Palestine, and they have excellent spokespeople, and they're actually responsive. But it's, it's, a, it's very nice ground. if you're if mm. you have all day to write your story or even you know mm. two days to write your story but do you know how long as a reporter i would have if there was a blast and we heard about it about 40 seconds before i'd have to be on air talking yeah, about and it. why do you need to hear the story of the blast from the israeli official uh, or from a pa official that doesn't know about it why not go and report on the blast from the side of the blast? Well, I'm That's what I'm Shirin Abu Akhli was doing. I'm telling she got you, the reporting but done. She also, she also had mm. to report seconds after something happened. Whether mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what, what so, I mean, you could have heard it because you're living there. And seconds after, you would have to be on air talking about it. And what I'm saying is that when you're trying to fill airtime and you have the Israeli military sending you pages and pages of mm -hmm. what happened, and you are trying to balance out the story and give the Palestinian mm -hmm. context, but if you don't have that context because you are new or because you haven't done your work and, and, and you, don't, you haven't been out there and you don't know the context, you will end up saying one side of the story, and that's mm -hmm. often what's happening. And so the best way to counter mm -hmm. that is to have you know to understand the story and to go into there is no there's no luxury of time in 24 7 broadcast news anymore mm -hmm. and and you know sadly the motto of broadcast news when i was working was mm -hmm. never long for wrong mm -hmm. so they didn't care if i was wrong they just said to me mm -hmm. don't just don't be lo wrong for long mm -hmm. so say it on air and correct yourself, but just say it, because we need to fill the airtime. It's very hard for you guys to understand the pressure you're under as a broadcast mm -hmm. journalist when there's breaking news, especially on, on television news. Mm -hmm. Shireen did an excellent job because she was able and she knew it in her head almost what, what the context was. So she could, she could read this in real time, decipher the Israeli military statement and, and, and talk for it. That is not a skill that very many, very many journalists have. And I think the information dumping that you're uh, that you're talking about on the part of Israeli authorities is, of course, uh, a colonial mechanism. That uh, I'm a historian, so I've seen it happen before. It happens in almost every context that you have where there's been a colonial uh, relationship of domination. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, there isn't a single occupation in history where there wasn't this imbalance of power when it came to information resources as well as other uh, forms of resources of this sort. So, but in this case, uh, I'm wondering about uh, another dimension here, <coughs> which is who gets to select the story? What was so spectacular about Shireen's reporting is that she wasn't just res responding to the Israeli selection. The Israelis want you to report if there is something that looks like it might be a threat to Israel's security that they've managed to respond to. That's really what they're, what they're looking for. But the constant everyday life of Palestinians is not a story. And we know that a lot of Western journalists fall into that trap. It's not a story if Palestinians die in Jenin. I know this because look for reporting on what has been going on in Nablus and Jenin over the past few months in the Western press. It's far and few in between, pieces here and there. It's hardly newsworthy. If there's an, uh, is, uh, killings of Israelis on this scale, that would be reported, wouldn't it? Look, I think, I mean, part of it uh, is also to understand the dynamics in these uh, institutions, because a lot of times it's the editors that make that call. The journalist can pitch a story, but the editor is the one who's going to come in there. And I've also seen a similar dynamic. Again, I'm not a journalist. I don't have a journalism experience. Um, you know, but I've also seen dynamics where, uh, you know, a story can be fantastic, but then the headline is, you know, written with the editor who is not in Jerusalem or Ramallah or Gaza, but is in New York or London and it comes out a certain way. Or, you know, the editor will say, no, I need more of the, of the other side of things. I think it's important to sort of also um, understand that when you say who, who chooses a story to report on, part of the problem, right, is that uh, is the framing uh, of how things are discussed, right? Periods of calm people talk about, right? Because in their mind, OK, yeah, what's new? It's occupation. There are killings. There are home demolitions. That's not a new story, right? So you know, we're talking about dynamics that aren't simply about the individual reporter. There are structures of how journalism works, the corporate structure. There's power dynamics. There's 
And there's also very organized pressure campaigns. Now, Shireen, I mean, Shireen laid out some of those dynamics, right? But you also have entire NGOs, you know, whose work is to dissect any story, try to find any weakness, try to find any mistake, and even if there is none, to then, you know, call and put pressure on editors. And th this is not unique to journalism, right? There's a similar matrix of NGOs that works on NGOs, right? NGO Monitor and others that focus on the reporting of, of, of NGOs. There's similar at the UN, UN Watch. So any sort of outlet that's reporting on stuff, there's a methodical effort to try and sort of muzzle or affect the way they do their reporting. So in spite of all that, though, you know, I do think there has been and there is a shift that's taking place in the way you know this is happening. It's, I think, in part the result of people like Shireen's reporting and efforts over many years and over many decades that things are starting to change. But I think the framing is what matters. Um, and for so long, the Israeli government um, and its supporters have dealt with this. Oh yeah, it's an, you know, it's a security situation. It's an occupation. You know, maybe we make some mistakes, quote unquote, but do you blame us? You know, it's a secure situation. The entire framing is essentially posited occupation versus terrorism. And in most people's mind, that story in a 9-11 and a militarized context, you know, is one that people inherently side with the uh, Israeli side of the narrative in many parts of the world, but that shifted. And I think a huge part of that has been the consensus that has developed in the human rights movement, which has been led, of course, by Palestinians who for years and decades have been describing their lived experience as one of apartheid. And now we have this moment where there's a consensus in the human rights movement from Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Israeli civil society groups, Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic, UN special experts, former government officials. And that's really shifting the narrative. And you've started also to see journalists um, you know, put events. And that happened, I think, in, in Palestine, served a lot of the credit during May 2021, when the Sheikh Jarrah events and, and the conflict there, where people were starting to really ask the question of why is this happening? Instead of it being rockets versus attacks, you started to get more about the context of home demolitions, et cetera. So, why is that? I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm a human rights lawyer. I'm not an expert on media analysis, but I can tell you there are many dynamics that are, that, that are taking place behind the scenes to make that happen. But I also want to acknowledge So, so before we switch uh, to the uh, question and answer from the audience, I want to ask you quickly, can you all account for this uh, uh, greater embrace of uh, uh, the realities on the ground on the part of human rights organizations? I mean, finally, after many decades of Palestinians, pointing out to the realities of apartheid, for example, going on in Palestine. We now have uh, B'Tselem, the leading Israeli human rights organization, uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, various other bodies, and of course, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur and other uh, uh, people acknowledging that what is going on in Palestine is apartheid. What, what explains that process? I know that you all have been involved in it somehow in different ways. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I can start with that. So I think, um, you know, m many people, when they hear the word apartheid, obviously think of South Africa. But international treaties, including the International Covenant on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, define apartheid as a universal legal term. It's a crime defined under its own convention in the 1970s, as well as the 1998, um, you know, Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court, right? So th this exists in various ways, but I think, the process of human rights organizations looking at it, I think, has probably three roots. And let me maybe just say a word about each of them because it's important. One is the lens of our analysis. So uh, many, you got, many of you are students, right? So you've done research. You know how research is. You tend to focus on a specific issue in a particular area. So at Human Rights Watch, you'll find reports on freedom of movement in Gaza, freedom to build in East Jerusalem, land access in Israel. But I think we had a process of reflecting, uh, pro particularly when the occupation turned 50 about six years ago, if, you know, and we've been working for three decades, is our focus on particular issues in certain areas missing the larger context? So we asked a different research question that led us to this report that was mentioned, uh, uh, Finding Apartheid. Our research question was, how does Israel treat Palestinians? So we did that using the methodology we use around the world. We cover 100 countries. We documented the facts. So we spent two years 
looking at how Israel treats Palestinians. We did case studies. We looked at different sources of information. Um, and then we applied the law, including the law that I just mentioned. And we reached the conclusion about apartheid. So the first dynamic that shifted was the lens that we looked was different. The second dynamic was le the law, right? Because although the laws I mentioned date back 1973, 1998, a key moment was 2015 when Palestine acceded to the Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court and became a, a part of the International Criminal Court. Because that was a moment where, where suddenly a major international court had jurisdiction over crime, including the crime of apartheid committed in Palestine. So that triggered many of us in, uh, to look at, this, uh, look at this crime where before it was sort of not at the top of mind. And the third dynamic, uh, and there might even be a fourth I should add too, but the third dynamic was the facts on the ground. A lot of the abuses that underlie apartheid date back 50, 70 years, right? Um, however, what we've seen in the last six years or so on the ground, or seven or eight or 10, is that the Israeli government, which for years um, you know, couched its rhetoric, and, and, and I think Shireen mentioned this in terms of the law and sort of finding the right defenses, the occupation's temporary. You know, even in court, they would go to court and say settlements are temporary. We don't intend to, to stay there in perpetuity. That pretext went, went away, right, where they directly said, I mean, Netanyahu can, has quotes saying, we intend to rule in Palestinians in perpetuity. And then in 2018, the Israeli uh, Knesset passed the Jewish nation state law, which enshrined as a constitutional value that certain rights, including the right to self-determination and settlement in the land of Israel, is reserved for only one of the two groups that lives between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, you know, Jewish Israelis. And then around annexation, you know, and, and the, the kind of plan to formally annex the West Bank, many more people were saying that's, that's apartheid. And so when you st st look at apartheid as a law, it doesn't require formal annexation. If you have a reality where one power dominates and rules in this way, it leads to that. So all these things together created a, a, a confluence of events that it became impossible to deny that reality of apartheid. And, and, and that's, I think, behind the moment that we're in. I think, I think that was that's such an excellent account, and it resonates very much for Amnesty's process as well, which took many years to come up, up with um, the, our apartheid report. So if I would just I just add one thing to to one of your one of your tracks, which is the lens, and I think that there was an acknowledgement by human rights organizations that the current way of looking at the conflict looking at it in terms of violations that were occurring in that moment, whether it be settlements, whether it be freedom of movement, whether it be other egregious violations, looking at it in this piecemeal way wasn't working. That un unless you look at the entire system that creates these violations, that created the need for this person to you know, try and cross over and not be allowed, or created the, you know, someone being shot in a refugee camp and so on, unless you look at the root cause, which is apartheid, we have no way of ending these violations. They will continue and people will continue to suffer. So I think that that is really the realization, the acknowledgement that, that happened. And for me as a journalist, Prior, I would always be very frustrated at the cyclical outrage that we saw with Israel-Palestine, that during a Gaza war, we would have Instagram posts and protests and so on, and then suddenly quiet, 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 quiet. And then something would happen, like a settlement, everyone would get upset again, like, where did this come from? And for people on the ground, it was like, well, it, it didn't just come out of nowhere. The, this Gaza war came out of this just happened, and then this happened. It is, it, it is a perpetual and everyday lived experience. And until we start to look at it, in, in that term, that sort of long-term way, there's no way of dismantling the, and, and ending these violations. Do you want to uh, comment on this? Yeah, I should just note, uh, and, and Shireen knows this and Omar know this, I, I'm always very hard on them because they use terminology that reflects the official positions of their organizations, of course, such as the Gaza war. It was an invasion <laughs> by a colonial power against a defenseless people under its colonial rule ruthless bombardment for days on end. Uh, and same with apartheid. It's not enough, Omar. You know, we always have this discussion. It's part of a bigger settler colonial matrix. But that's just the historian in me. I know you guys follow no, legal just, procedures. Yeah, but just a 30-second reply would just be, we, I don't think, I mean, I don't want to speak for Shireen, but none of us are saying it's not. No, no, I, I understand. I yeah, just, but what we're saying yeah. is that, I mean, crimes take place in a context. We have a mandate as Human Rights Watch. Mm -hmm. We apply the law. We, we document facts. We apply the law, right? I think it's important that you read 
these reports in the context of there's a great amazing body of scholarship by historians and others on settler colonialism you should you know read these they take place in a context crimes and you should read the crimes in the context of these things and read other scholarship so by no means are we saying read only the human rights report that is the answer to all things we are saying you know read these and read read critiques of them by the way too. make your own opinions don't just listen to us but also read uh, other lenses that can bring in other perspectives and I would say listen to the Palestinians yeah. which is the voice that is missing all too often in this. Okay, so we have uh, now uh, some time for uh, Q&A. Uh, does anybody have a question in mind? If you do, please go to the mics and uh, wait uh, for me to call on you so that we can have the process orderly. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, Can you please also introduce your, yourself, and if you're a student or faculty or a member of the community, let us know. Yeah, yeah um, I'm a student at Brown. Um, I wanted to ask, um, so the most that both of your reports, and I'm talking about Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, uh, mention is the World Zionist Organization, but and actually, um, you just mentioned that in, in your eyes, the root cause is apartheid. So I, I wanted to ask, why is there literally zero mention of the word, or the word Zionism, colonialism, or settler colonialism? I searched both. They don't, they, the closest is World Zionist Organization. So why is there no mention of those uh, histories? Um, to sort of piggyback on, on your question just a moment ago. Um, and especially since this panel is called, or part of it is colonial domination. Um, my other question is for all three panelists. Uh, I see a lot of parallels between the murder of Shirin Abu Akleh and the ongoing imprisonment of Julian Assange, um, but I don't see a lot of overlap in those two worlds. So how do we bring people from uh, all political walks of life um, together to connect the dots and understand the importance of freedom of the press and persecution of journalists for the crime of doing journalism? Thank you. Thank you for your question. We have another question there. Hi, uh, my name is Nader. I'm also a Palestinian American. Um, I'm a senior at Brown. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Jennifer, I'm so sorry for your loss. Shireen was truly an icon for Palestinians and Arab journalism in general. Um, given that the crime of apartheid is being committed, and particularly now, with the victory of far-right political parties in the recent Israeli election, isn't it about damn time to tell the US to stop providing the Israeli army with $3.8 billion in military aid every year, which I'd like to emphasize is significantly more than any other country. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for being here. It means a lot for, I think I can speak on behalf of all students here to have you all um, <coughs> and hear your perspectives. I guess I just wanna ask that I think the US Justice Department just announced that there was an FBI investigation that was launched today or yesterday on the death of Shina Boakle, and I wanted to see why now and what are your thoughts on it. Um, just curious. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll take one more in this round, and then uh, we'll open the floor again in one second. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you very much um, to all of our speakers. To Ms. Jennifer, thank you. Um, I am uh, Lavelle Williams. I am a student at the MPA, excuse me, at the School of Public Health, an MPH student at the School of Public Health. And my, uh, my question is in regards to growing engagement around this particular issue in American um, circles. I think that cult culturally, uh, we as especially young Americans have a penchant for getting involved with political issues, but I think that in uh, the particular area of the world that this issue takes place in, there is a particular sense of othering. Um, and my question is, how can we take away the sense of othering and increase the sense of uh, empathy and therefore involvement in order to make events like this <clears throat> not much of a uh, silo occurrence, but rather increase the involvement at large? Thank you very much. So uh, Jennifer, do you want to start uh, with the questions that were posed? Um, do we want to do start? Sure. Yeah. 
Okay. On the Jonah take, I mean, I feel like you're very good with the, the sure. white Zionism. You work so much in the apartheid culture. Yeah, maybe I'll take that one and the military aid one, those are, and then leave the other ones. But uh, uh, thank you for your question. So a couple of things, right? And I think it's actually an important point to note, because when we talk about apartheid, um, the, the law around apartheid, the prohibition, the crime, most people think proving apartheid means you need to prove that there's racism. But that's actually not an element of the crime. The crime itself requires the mental state, the intent that's required is an intent to dominate, right? And the reason why you might want to dominate somebody could be racism, but it could also be anything else. It could just be, I believe my, you know, I want to protect my own and so I'm going to dominate other people. But that's actually not an element of the crime itself. So for Human Rights Watch, we didn't need to reach the question of racism or look at Zionism because the the, we were trying to understand how does Israel treat Palestinians and what are the, mo you know, what are the sort of policy justifications and motivations and then assess them against the law. So reaching the question of Zionism, and again, it goes back to the mission mandate of the organization, discussing what, and again, you know, Zionism is what it means. There's a rich body of writing and literature. You can read it in many different disciplines. It's just not what a human rights lawyer does. We document facts on the ground and we apply the law. So that's uh, the reason why we didn't, and, and what Zionism means varies to different people. So that's a body of critically important scholarship that Palestinians and others have written about, and I encourage you to read it, but it's not what a human rights um, organization does. <clears throat> same, same thing about settler, I mean, uh, a, a little bit different about settler colonialism. Colonialism, again, um, apartheid's a crime. It's defined under treaties as a definition. So that's why we deal with it. Let me give you an anecdote. Maybe it's an easier way to sort of understand what Human Rights Watch work is. So it was mentioned in my bio that I wrote the report about the mass killings of protesters in Egypt, the Rabat killing. When I wrote that report, I went to my editors and said, I really want to make the title of this report, Egypt's Tiananmen, because I want people to understand the gravity of the killings. And my editor said, no, we don't make comparisons. That's not what we do. So that's not a title you can use. Um, I make the point to just say that the way we work, and that's you know, um, how Human Rights Watch works, and you know, we're not, we shouldn't be the end all be all address for every avenue, is that we apply the law. And, the, and colonialism, subtle colonialism are very critical frameworks, concepts that are out there, but they're not enshrined with a definition under the law. So that's why we don't reach that question. Uh, and the military aid question is a very quick and easy answer, which is yes, um, our recommendations in the report are very straightforward, right? That, uh, you know, uh, military aid to, to, to any country should be contingent on them stopping crimes against humanity. And so long and aid should be suspended so long as Israel's perpetuating crimes against humanity. Let me just note for this audience, we also found, as Human Rights Watch, apartheid and persecution being committed against the Rohingya um, <coughs> in Myanmar. Uh, we also found crimes against humanity and persecution in the treatment of Uyghurs in China, and our recommendations, including around military aid, are consistent. Okay. Um, maybe I'll take the, the, the last one from Lafell. Thank you for that, because I think it goes I think it goes straight to the heart of why it's so frustrating to cover and to even be um, an observer of the Israel Palestine conflict. Because if I asked you all to think of a French person in your head, you could you probably all have an image, right? If I asked you to even think of a Syrian person in your head, you probably all have an image, some some something. If I asked you all to think of uh, someone from Gaza, a Gazan person, does anyone have an image apart from those of you maybe from the region? It's, it's really difficult, right? Because I think the, that the Israelis have done a very good job of dehumanizing Palestinians in general and Gazans in spe specifically. In fact, to the point where there's this impression that Ga the Gaza Strip is full of nothing but two and a half million terrorists. Um, when in fact, you know, most of the population are very young um, and have lived under nothing but siege and occupation and blockade um, and, are, and are really traumatized by war and everything else. Um, but that's not the story that's told. And I think that one way to increase this empathy and not see, uh, you know, them as the other and um, really feel for it and, 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 and want to go out and do more to help is to, is to understand, is to know what a Gazan person looks like, is to read, um, is to visit, is to be interested. And that is the first step, really, in, in creating that kind of empathy and know that while you're doing it, that in itself is an act of protest against the machinery that is trying to stop you from humanizing Palestinians. So again, thank you for that question. And Tanea, did I tell you to write to your congressperson and, and ask the same question about military aid, please? Mm -hmm. um, I, 
think this this might sort of cover the military aid and FBI investigation, and in that um, the uh, the family is very uh, happy about the FBI investigation, and that it's a good um, uh, f first step, and it's what we've been asking for. Um, uh, Shireen's brother and um, nieces and nephew went to D.C. and lobbied um, government officials a lot to try to uh, get accountability, and they've been working tirelessly for that. And so we're um, all very happy to be at this initial stage. It's the, as I said, um, the normal uh, occurrence when a U.S. citizen is killed abroad by a foreign government, and so we are also um, happy to have a law applied um, equally <laughs> and not uh, not differently for Palestinians. Um, uh, the Justice for Shireen Act that was introduced um, by Rep Representative Carson has a component in it that asks for um, you, what, what link there is between U.S. aid and U.S. weaponry and the killing of Shireen, and that's important. Um, when you look at the military aid, because of course that gives the information um, to the government to withhold possibly aid under the Leahy law or under um, new initiatives to hold um, back that money, back the military aid, um, and the Leahy law, you know, uh, says that you should not, we should not give military aid to anyone who uses, who violates human rights with impunity. So. Um, I hope that kind of answered those. Um, and as for uh, growing engagement, I think um, I think the fact that there has been a lot of um, movements that have been encouraged and strengthened and bolstered by, <laughs> unfortunately, just the incredibly horrific situation in so many places, um, including including here, has led to what I see as a hopeful linking of, of issues. And, um, you know, for example, between Ferguson and um, Gaza, you know, there were people from Palestine telling, um, giving advice about uh, the, what is it called? And I just lost the words, my gosh. How to, how to um, protect yourself from the tear gas canisters when they explode. And um, you have people at rallies wearing um, you know, for George Floyd wearing, you know, Free Palestine shirts. And I think that there's common cause, and I think that it's increasingly being um, discovered and sort of celebrated by people who are active in these issues. And so I do think the othering is intense, but I sort of think that there's some coalition of the othered that's happening. Um, and I hope that also people who consider themselves to believe in certain principles in some cases will be increasingly um, held accountable for having a more universal approach if you have certain principles you stand up for. Hopefully we'll all hold each other more accountable to apply those principles universally. So whether or not it's convenient or contrary to what you've heard already or what um, feels more natural. So, On that powerful note, uh, I'd like to thank our speakers for honoring us with their presence today uh, and for sharing with us their insights uh, based on years and years of uh, experience. And in the case of uh, uh, Jennifer, also uh, personal uh, and intimate uh, knowledge, uh, familial relation, and uh, uh, the experience of having to deal with uh, uh, this situation as a lawyer and an attorney and a human rights person who has to uh, confront, in this case, uh, the killing of her own cousin. It is a very difficult uh, thing to talk about, but she spoke about it with such grace uh, and with uh, such uh, uh, power. Uh, I really, really uh, think that we owe her uh, a big clap. And thank you to Shireen and Omar. I, I know I'm tough on you guys. I'm always tough on. But if I didn't admire and respect your work, of course, we wouldn't be hosting you today. I have a great deal of admiration for all or the incredible work that you've been doing. 
uh, without uh, this shift that is going on now uh, in places like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, where there is greater and greater engagement, finally, with the situation in Palestine as uh, it is unfolding on the ground, uh, we would be uh, losing a lot. So you're helping people across the world see the situation for what it is, and I salute you uh, for that. Thank you, everyone, and have a beautiful evening.